Uh, hello and uh, welcome. My name is John Baskin. I'm an editor at The Point Magazine, an American-based uh, philosophical magazine. And um, I'm honored to be here today to talk to Ivan Vevoda. Uh, Ivan is a permanent fellow at the Institute for Human Sciences since 2017, where he's doing, uh, directing a research program on Europe's future. Uh, he was previously the senior vice president for programs at the German Marshall Fund in Washington, D.C. And before that, from 2003 to 2010, uh, the executive director of the GMF Balkan, Tr Balkan Trust for, for, uh, for Democracy, a project dedicated to strengthening democratic institutions in southeastern Europe. Um, so that's just his uh, sort of nonprofit civil society experience. Um, he's also served in government, working as a senior advisor on foreign policy and European integration for two prime ministers in Serbia uh, during tumultuous times of political transition, which hopefully we'll, we'll talk about a bit today. Um, and finally, he also has a, a distinguished career as an academic. Um, he's held several professorships in different European countries. Uh, the longest of them, I think, is a political scientist uh, at the Institute for European Studies in Belgrade. Um, he's published widely on civil society, totalitarianism, and democracy, um, and he's the editor of many, uh, many books, including um, a couple that will be of relevance today, uh, particularly uh, Yugoslavia and After, A Study in Fragmentation, Despair, and Rebirth, which was published in 1997, a, a volume of essays that he co-edited. Um, so he's going to start by talking a little bit about the conflict in Yugoslavia and sort of what it means in the broader context of Europe or what it meant then and what it means today. Uh, and then I'll ask him some questions and we'll talk for about a, a half hour and then we'll open it up to the audience uh, for more questions. John, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming here on this beautiful Sunday afternoon. It's always unclear whether rain or sun is better or worse for things like the Vienna Humanities Festival, but it seems to be evened out between yesterday and today. Um, as I was preparing for this uh, uh, conversation with, uh, with John, and he alluded to this book, Yugoslavia and After, that I edited with my colleague at University of Sussex in, in the United Kingdom uh, more than 20 years ago, um, as, as we were preparing it, uh, we put the subtitle, as, as John said, A Study in Fragmentation, Despair and Rebirth, because I knew that there would be a Vienna Humanities Festival with the title Hope and Despair. So, well prepared uh, in advance, but we also obviously have Rebirth, uh, which is sort of a stronger sense, not only of hope, but things can get better after they get very badly, badly worse. Um, I'm gonna say a, a few words about the, the broader context, and the first thing I'd like to say is what happened in Yugoslavia is a European story. It's not some kind of freakish accident uh, in, a, in a blissful and wonderful history of Europe. It just replicates some of the worst things that happened in Europe, but at a very strange time, at the end of the 20th century, when at least we thought that Europe would not see violent conflict again. European leaders like Macron like to say, you know, that Europe has lived this very long period of peace, 70 years of peace. That's partially true. It, it applies to Western Europe, because just to remind us, and I think it's important, there were two invasions of two European countries by the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact. The invasion of Hungary in 1956, a war on the European continent, and of course, the invasion of Czechoslovakia in 1968, again by the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact armies. What happened in uh, Yugoslavia was uh, something completely unexpected because we were all taught the same stories as you others in Europe, that war should never happen again, that the Holocaust should need not be repeated. At school, we were taught the same stories, we read the same books, we saw the same movies, we were taken to the concentration camps to see what should not be repeated. And I must make a confession as a social and political scientist that I totally didn't see this coming. And so there was something of a flaw in 
my education and my understanding of uh, the history of Europe and what can happen, or to put it very simply, that the darkest times can return at any moment if the conditions, social, political, culture and other, create the situation where violence can occur. And so it was a huge and very difficult lesson, not only as a social scientist, but as, as a citizen of a country that no longer exists. And it is important to say that there were three countries that disappeared after the fall of uh, the Iron Curtain and the Berlin Wall. The three countries, of course, are the Soviet Union, Czechoslovakia, and Yugoslavia. They were all communist federations, which, does, which means that they were federations in, in, in form. There was nothing about it where the uh, component parts of the federations had sort of a say at uh, democratic institutions or, or other. Czechoslovakia, of course, disappeared uh, through a peaceful uh, separation called the Velvet Divorce. The Soviet Union separated more or less without violence. There was, of course, some violence in, in the Baltic states, and uh, about 13 new countries emerged. Yugoslavia went down in the worst fashion through a violent conflict, and uh, today this country that was 22 million people is uh, a space where there are seven new countries. And so, again, European history, if you look in, in the long term, is something that was repeated here at the most unexpected time. Some say, and of course, two of these countries were created uh, in 1918 at the Versailles Conference. Czechoslovakia appeared. Uh, from the Versailles Treaty and Yugoslavia, the, the work of people like uh, American President Woodrow Wilson and Lloyd George and Georges Clemenceau of France. And some people have seriously or flippantly said that what happened in Yugoslavia and Czechoslovakia was the unfinished business of Versailles, that somehow Versailles didn't go far enough, that it did not actually see to it that nations and states coincided. But that's a, a longer and more historical debate uh, which, which needs kind of more, more refined um, analysis. But the fact is that these countries emerged and then they disappeared uh, somewhat later. And uh, I think the fact uh, for me, and this is kind of the, th basically I wrote this book with, with my colleagues to try and explain to myself why did my country disappear in front of me and my family and, and our friends? What, what was it that led to, to this? And uh, some people who have uh, sort of written uh, reviews of this book said that I engage in a structural analysis. Maybe so. Um, but the fact is that there wasn't democracy, you know, to simplify it uh, completely and that there was, like in other communist states that were totalitarian, semi-totalitarian, or light totalitarian, because Yugoslavia was not behind the Iron Curtain, it was in front of the Iron Curtain. There were many more liberties. We could travel freely at university. You could read liberal philosophy and, and study and publish. Uh, I was the publisher of a book series called Libertas, where we published you know, Montesquieu and Isaiah Berlin and kind of all of these things. So there wasn't an obvious reason as, as you were living as a citizen that it would necessarily go from communism into violence uh, before it went into some kind of hopefully democratic uh, transition. And it did. But the question, and this is linked to what Ivan Krastev was saying yesterday and partially also Misha Glenny in his talk, what seemed to many at that time in 1990, 91 to be the exception, the fact that Yugoslavia was going through a populist, tribalist, you know, call it what you want, um, fascist uh, uh, dynamic where the ethnic identitarian politics took over and that the leaders of the respective republics, as they were called, the six republics, uh, 
went at each other's throat to retain politics, that this was completely like the car going on the wrong way on the highway when all the other cars are going in this direction. Ivan Krastev, in his very creative way, said, well, maybe this was the real direction of history and all the cars going in the other direction were actually the exception, that it was the end of history, that it was liberalism triumphant, that everybody will, would become democratic in the world and that there would be a convergence towards uh, something that was what we would call a kind of a, a society where uh, democracy, freedom, the rule of law, and human rights would prevail. Uh, it was stunning to see uh, that basically 15 or 20 years later with the uh, onset of the economic and financial crisis, suddenly you started seeing populist and tribalism and identitarianism in everywhere from the United States to, to Germany uh, and, and backwards. And suddenly what we thought was the total exception suddenly became I don't want to say the norm, but a very strong political dynamic uh, in a variety of countries. And of course, the, mixture is, uh, the picture is mixed and we have a variety of, of views. One final thing I want to say uh, uh, before uh, I f close this, this brief introduction, and this is linked to what Misha Glenny was saying for those of you who were here, about organized crime, global organized crime, what he calls Mac Mafia, actually had a, a strong center in Europe in the war that uh, engulfed uh, and made Yugoslavia disappear. And that is uh, the fact that uh, it induced a lot of organized crime because Yugoslavia came under the harshest sanctions that had ever been imposed on any country. And I seriously say everything was sanctions. There was no Coca-Cola, no Mickey Mouse on television anymore. Every aspect of uh, investment and trade was cut off. And that meant that the leaders of these uh, now smaller states had to uh, engage in, in smuggling. Uh, and that was something that then criminalized the region as well. And so when Milosevic was finally uh, thrown out of power peacefully by choice in the elections in 2000, we were left, uh, at least in, in the country that now became mine, called Serbia, in a criminalized society and a criminalized state. And that has been a lot of reason why it has been more difficult to get out of the, uh, uh, of the past that, that we had and obviously, like other countries where corruption is, is still um, present, it is something that is very important to, to be tackled. And we've seen, unfortunately, with the killing of journalists in, in Slovakia or in, uh, or in Malta, uh, that this is not something that any country is immune to. And finally, last note, on a, on a personal note, uh, the, the disappearance of, of your country is not something I would wish anyone to have to live through. It's, it's a very traumatic experience uh, to live through the loss of country because you're, you're, you're in school, you, there's the map of your country and you sort of, there's this Im embedded view, there's a, a hymn to the country that you're used to when your sports people win and suddenly there's a blank sheet. And so I think living here for two and a half years, I've come to understand how difficult it must have been for those who lived the end of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, not to say that these things are equal, but in the lives of people, and that's why I say it's a European story, it has happened many times through history. The only strange thing is that it happened in Europe when it shouldn't have happened. So. Uh, I'm going to pick, start by sort of picking up a little bit on that personal note and we're going to talk a lot about sort of uh, moving forward from 1989, what lessons and what uh, things we can take for today's politics from that experience. But first I want to kind of go before um, and think a little and, and just ask you a bit about what shaped your own political hopes for your country coming up to 1989 and, and, and what you thought would happen. Uh, after the fall of, of the Soviet Union um, and sort of how your own political education, you mentioned Czechoslovakia in 1968, but you've also written about your education in Paris at that time and how that shaped some of your political hopes um, going forward. So I thought uh, you could talk a little about that. 
Okay, well, it reveals my age, but 1968 was an extremely important uh, event, uh, and for someone, and you rightly mentioned, not only the events in 68 in Paris, but for example in Belgrade, there was strong student movement uh, in 68 against the regime, against what was called the red bourgeoisie. Students were realizing the inequalities that were appearing in socialist society, quote unquote, of Yugoslavia at that time, but it was also a time of demand for free speech. So what was happening in California with Mario Savio and the Students for a Democratic Society, there was a kind of Weltgeist uh, that moved from you know, the shores of the Pacific to kind of Eastern Europe. There were events in Warsaw and, and other countries like that. So that was really the, my coming of age politically, but the other one, as you mentioned, was Czechoslovakia. I was in front of the Czechoslovak embassy in Belgrade on that day in August where there were thousands of stranded Czechoslovak tourists not knowing what to do with the Soviet tanks in the middle of Prague. It was, again, traumatic to see what happens when your country is invaded by a, by a foreign power. And so to, to simplify, it was just the understanding that freedom was paramount, the dignity of the human being to be free and to speak freely and to associate freely. And then in the 80s, I became part of sort of the intellectual opposition to the communist regime. I wasn't a daredevil or a street fighter, but we wrote petitions for greater freedoms. We wrote petitions for people to be freed from jail that were put in jail for political reasons. And so when 89 happened, and to replicate what other people were saying yesterday, I mean, this was a huge hope. This was really the hope, and I, created something with friends called the Political Forum, Democratic Political Forum, and we wanted to be intellectuals who would not engage in politics but have a political voice. And we knew that any government would need to criti be criticized because there's no perfect government. And I wrote the programmatic piece of Yugoslavia joining the European Union in December 1989. So I had no doubt and Yugoslavia was the most qualified, and that was not only the opinion of us Yugoslavs or those who believed in Europe and joining, but that was the case in Brussels. Uh, the Yugoslav, the last Yugoslav government led by Ante Markovic, a, a Croatian politician, but he was prime minister, he went to Brussels to start negotiating the renewed relationship because important to notice, Yugoslavia had relations with the European community since 1971. So it was well seen on a kind of Western road, and then suddenly after this hope, you know, there was this total despair, and then we had to deal with that. Yeah, so could you talk a little more about that in terms of sort of where, looking back 30 years later, or, you know, where, where do you think the hopes were misplaced, or what were some of the hinge points where the hope started to turn uh, in that period right after, uh, right after 1989? Well, what, you know, in 1989, I was, as, as you mentioned, I was working at the European Institute for European Studies, and it was the year of the bicentenary of the French Revolution. And having studied in France and being a sort of political phil philosopher and theorist, I organized a Yugoslav-wide conference on the meaning of the French Revolution, 200 years later, what it meant. And what I learned, and we did an edited volume, and I, I wrote the introductory piece, what I understood from that, and it helped me very much to navigate what happened later, that the revolution in France, it took basically France a hundred years to get a stable democratic regime, and that was, for those of you who know your history, 1870 with the Third Republic. It went through about six regimes. It went through Napoleon, it went through Empire, it went to the Second Republic, to Louis Napoleon, to the, again, Empire, to the Paris Commune, of course, in being invaded by Germany before that. And so it told me that these things are one more complicated than they seem at the moment of kind of opening and hope and rebirth. And secondly, that they take much longer than you think uh, at, at the beginning. Um, and uh, um, a Hungarian sociologist's uh, name who escapes me at this moment, and who's passed away, unfortunately, he was the first director of the Hungarian television uh, after the democratic changes, wrote about, you know, first there's 
Anus Mirabilis, the, the miracle year, then there's Anus Miserabilis after that, then there's Anus Decepcionis, you know, the year of deception, then there, the realism hits in with the Anus Realismi. It's basically describing the fact that things are, are much more difficult, take much longer. And that was really my, and, and you know, the, my, my, my friends, uh, we then uh, created something called the Belgrade uh, forum of independent intellectuals that was called by the, our opponents, the nationalists, the other Serbia. And we started organizing panels and organizing demonstrations against the war. I remember the first one when Dubrovnik was being uh, shelled by the Yugoslav army. There were about 150 of us uh, in front of the presidential palace. These protests then grew enormously when Sarajevo was attacked. So it was not so black and white, you know, as the media portrayed it, Serbia bad, Croatia, Slovenia good. Uh, in Serbia, there was always a split, a polarized society like you have today in many countries. Half of us were against Milosevic through, and this is where political science comes in, because of the particular electoral law, which was like the British or the French, the first past the post, Milosevic was able to gain a, a two-thirds majority in the parliament with only 43% of the vote. Um, I want to talk a little about nationalism and, you know, this set of ethnic nationalism that was so much a part of, of what happened in Yugoslavia. And you've made the point that the, uh, the sort of decentralization of power, or at least the illusion of power within these different ethnic uh, groups uh, before the 1989, in some ways, uh, ended up leading people to, to sort of have a lot of their identities invested in, in ethnicity and in, and in you know, and, and you, you, you talk about the fact that political identity, you could say you were a Serb or you were a Croat, but people couldn't say they were on the political right or the political left. And I wonder sort of, uh, what do you think it is about ethnic identity that um, was so uh, recalcitrant to, to sort of, uh, you know, after, after 1989, and why did it create so many problems um, for the country being able to come together after that in the way that political identities might not? Yeah, that, that was a, a quote from, from, I can't remember now whether it was a journalist or someone else who said, you know, Yugoslavia, you can't say you're a leftist or a rightist, you can say you're a Serb or a Croat. And that was kind of the way of expressing it. It's a simplistic way of saying how we got into this. The, the other, I think, important thing to say re regarding that is really, and this goes back to the uh, editor's uh, meeting that happened two days ago about forgetting or not forgetting history and, you know, what's better and can we, by remembering, not repeat history. Uh, in Yugoslavia, like, like in other places, you know, the, the partisans were victorious. It was Victor's uh, history written, and you know we we went forward into the bright socialist or, or communist future. And because of trauma of war in every country, our, our parents really didn't talk to us about that. It was the bad past. You know things had had been going forward, but then we later realized that there were parents who were talking to their children and said, you know, uh, both the bad. And, and, and the good. And what I mean by that is that I think you do need to confront the past. You do need to address this issue. You know, maybe you can find catharsis. Um, you know, the Germans were made to look, you know, starkly into what they had done and to create institutions to do that. Uh, in a country like Yugoslavia, this had not happened because during the liberation war, at the same time, there was a very violent civil war between the various groups and not to go into that. And the fact that that had not been dealt with emerged. And I think to, to demonstrate to you how leaders can deal with these things, I will make the parallel with, with Spain. In Spain, when Franco died, all the political parties from the Communist Party to the Monarchist parties, they agreed we will not touch the history of the Civil War, because if we open that Pandora's box, all hell will break loose and we'll probably have another war. Now, those of you who follow closely world news in Spain, you will know that there's 
the decision now to exhume Franco from his grave in Valle de los Caídos and to put him in some other place. In Yugoslavia, the exact opposite happened. The politicians, to legitimize themselves as national leaders of Serbia, Croatia, Bosnia, etc., decided to go into the Pandora's box of the civil war and say, these guys are going to go after us. These guys will go after us. And there was suddenly a kind of circus of very deadly circus of recrimination. You are to blame for this and that. You are to blame. And there was a kind of circle of fear that appeared. Because the, all, they were all communist politicians, and to retain power, they needed a legitimization. The, the easiest tool was nationalism, identitarian politics, and they were unfortunately very successful at whipping up these emotions. I do want to add that there was a socio-economic component. I don't want to be too Marxist about this, but I think we cannot deny that uh, we had a, a shortages crisis after Tito's death in the mid-80s. There was an unemployment crisis. Susan Woodward, whom some of you know, who's a scholar, wrote a, a big fat book called Balkan Tragedy, where he, she uses this argument very eloquently to describe that aspect of what led to, to the breakdown. But I think you need to combine these different levels of analysis to understand that nationalism really took the upper upper hand and looking at what's happening today, again to go to the various uh, IFDs, Pegidas, the, the Le Pens or the Salvinis, you see how that populist rhetoric or Trump for that matter is being used. Yeah, and one of the things you talk about a lot in that book, sort of a more subtle issue having to do with the sort of political habits of the people, that, that how they'd been shaped by communism and what that meant for the process afterwards. And uh, you've talked about the need to sort of this, uh, a sense of a need for a political learning process. Um, and I wonder, you know, given what's happening in some countries, well, in some countries today that do have longer political habits, but still maybe might find a need for um, the, the, these to, a sort of way to re-educate people in these things. I wonder what your own experience with that was, what you mean by sort of, or what institutions or practices you found helpful uh, as, as things moved forward um, in Yugoslavia for, or in, and in Serbia for uh, helping people recover from some of the habits that they had gained under communism. Well, I mean, you know, it, it, for, for those who, who indulge in, in this business of social science and, and studying these societies, I mean, totalitarianism in whatever shape or form uh, has an atomized society. Individuals are disjointed. The party has the upper hand. You know, there's what Ferenc Fecher, the, the late husband of the late Agnes Heller, wrote, there's a kind of positive anthropology, you know, Stalin says the human being, the person, the man is the greatest value of our society, and the negative anthropology is no, you cannot come nowhere near political power, and you're kept away, and then in this disjointed situation, uh, nobody has actually the experience of what is real politics, or the positive side of politics, everyone has the experience of manipulated politics, of the politics of evil, as the French philosopher Paul Ricoeur would say. And the fact that people don't have this experience, when suddenly the, the, the door is open, the light comes in, people don't know how to actually behave. You know, you have to learn the, the, the kind of the Kinderstube of democracy, of associating, of kind of knowing that you have a voice and that you can speak up and that there's a public space which is one which allows you the liberty and the protection to say what you want, you know, to use the classical definition of a, of a liberal society. It's pluralism, it's legality, and it's the public space. It's without those three things, we don't have a liberal society. And that is what takes time to learn in, in any uh, society, and that is what needs protecting when people forget what they have. That's why we say in the United States, at least there are checks and balances, and maybe Trump won't be able to do to 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 disassemble uh, these uh, the architecture of the democratic institutions on which we rely to have the kind of freedoms that we have. And so, 
what happened is we realized that, you know, we had to roll up our sleeves when Milosevic fully took power, and he took power in 1987, remember, but that's another story. And, uh, but when he became the kind of the nationalist leader that wanted to do what, what he did, and that was to slowly start putting the building blocks in what East European dissidents in the 70s and 80s called oases of civil society. We needed to create these spaces and slowly start expanding them. So, yeah, we talked a little earlier about this, that, uh, you know, you make this, this criticism of communism that made people sort of self-focused and, and, and uh, drastically narrowed the space for public politics, the Vita Activa. Um, you know, there are some who say, especially on the left, that liberalism uh, in some of these countries, because of the influence of capitalism and the market and consumerism, has likewise uh, sort of distracted people or removed them from feeling like they have a, a, a real stake in public life and that that has something to do with some of the reemergence of, of more populist or illiberal politics. I wonder, as, as sort of a, yeah, as sort of a liberal intellectual, how you think about the way that liberal societies, some of which, like, you know, uh, unlike Yugoslavia in 1989, have had longer uh, experiences of democratic habits, but seem to have some of them being undermined now, sort of how, um, how liberals can think about that problem from, from that direction too. Yeah, let, let me preface that by saying um, that, the, that Yugoslavia was a totalitarian society of the softest kind, and that is important because ultimately the backbone was a communist society with the political monopoly of power and politics in the hands of one party and no one else was allowed to come close or you landed in jail. I say that because you can give the greatest freedoms and I mentioned them, travel, education, a private enterprise to a certain level. I, I quote in this book a, a shop owner of an optical shop in Sarajevo a woman who said, we had a shop in Sarajevo, we had a shop in Belgrade, we do weekends of skiing in the Swiss Alps and going to Paris. And, and she said, but, but, and the war had already started, she said, but we realized that we had left politics to everybody else. And that's what a kind of consumer society does. People indulge in, the, in their private habits, which is the characteristic of modern society, as Benjamin Constant in his famous essay about the liberty of the ancients and modern says. But as you remember, Constant concludes his essay by saying, but wait a minute, somebody must be looking at what the politicians, what politics are doing. Because if we all go back to tend our garden, like Voltaire says, you know, there's always the danger of power alienating itself. And then to your question on liberalism, you know, it is the question about checks and balances also in the market. As a very good American friend says, you know, we talk about deregulation of the market and what led to the subprime crisis and, you know, the fall of Lehman Brothers, etc. He, I think, rightly uh, alerted me and others to the fact he's called, actually, no, this is regulating for the richest part of society. This was regulating so that people could make profits above profits above profits. And that is where you cannot, there is not such thing as an unfettered market that will kind of ra raise all ships and, and level things out. The state must come in or, or the, pu the public interest and the common good must come in so that these forces that would like to completely be unhinged from control be brought back under control. And I think that's what we're seeing. That's why we have the, the rise of inequality, not to raise the bigger question of our whole model of society and civilization where growth and profit are the de determination of everything and you know everyone having two or three cars in, in certain countries. So I wanted to also touch a little on your experience actually working in government uh, mm -hmm. with the Serbian Prime Minister, uh, Zoran Djindjic. Uh, in, from 2001, you, you worked in his administration until 2003, and I know that you saw him as someone that, that did give uh, reason for hope, a, a sort of liberal politician who was able to be effective uh, in those circumstances. And I wondered um, if you could talk a little bit about his qualities as a politician and also if there are any 
politicians today. I know, you know, in a, in a, in a speech in 2017, you spoke optimistically about Macron, uh, and and I wonder sort of how you think about that now, and 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 whether you see where you see reasons for hope today in dealing with the reemergence of some of these nationalist uh, and populist movements. Well, to, to state the, the obvious, which must be constantly repeated, there is no such thing as an angelic politician. Uh, they're all human beings with their faults uh, and, their, uh, and their positive sides. Uh, it, I think the balance there is, is, is what counts. Uh, Jinjic inherited, as I said, a criminalized society. We all did, uh, and a criminalized state. And it was about, you know, moving forward uh, in the quickest possible way to catch up because, you know, the transition had started in, uh, in Hungary, in Poland in 1989. This was 2000, 11 years later. We were not only the last wagon of the train, but kind of the, the, the caboose at, at the very end. And you had to have a fast pace to catch up if you wanted to, to, to join Europe uh, in, in the sense of the European Union. And so he was extremely energetic. He was a, a philosopher, a political philosopher by trade. And he simply had this, uh, this energy of you know, getting up and, and going about uh, doing these things. But as Klaus Offe, the German sociologist wrote already in, in the 90s, uh, he, said, he wrote about uh, and spoke about the, what he called the simultaneity problem. So when you come out of a society like the communist societies, you simultaneously have to change everything, your politics, your economy, your education system, your trade system. It, it's not, you know, at least the, 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 after the, the dictatorship in Portugal and Spain and Greece, they had a capitalist society, uh, economy at least, so you didn't have to do that. There, there were all these, these other things. But, so the simultaneity problem was something that, that we confronted. And the only thing I learned being in government, because I'd studied it, I'd written about it, you know, I'd sort of, we lived it uh, as a family and, and friends, was the humility of understanding that you're juggle, juggling 20 balls at the same time. And obviously four balls will fall. You can't keep them all in the air and moving at the same time, in spite of the political will, of this readiness of society to move forward. And you realized, you know, what I learned from studying the French Revolution, that this will take time, but there needs to be a kind of forceful movement on some of the key things. And I'd like to recall the, the famous quote of Ralph Dierendorf, the German sociologist, uh, British Lord, who in his book on reflections on the revolution in Eastern Europe, written in 1990, wrote, uh, about this very thing. He said, you can change a constitution in the span of six weeks and write a new one. You can probably turn around your economy and stop the command economy and give the market uh, forces uh, the right to act in about six months. But he says it will take about 60 years to get a full-blown democratic civil society with a public space where people know how to use their voice and their freedom of association. And uh, that, that was kind of a very succinct way of putting uh, in front of us what the challenge was, because obviously he knew his history very well. And sort of my cautiously optimistic uh, comment to that, well, at least 30 years have gone by, so we have another 30 years until we have that democratic civil society. Uh, and then, you know, today, what sort of gives you a sense of hope about uh, coming through the period right now politically? Um, yeah. Look, uh, well, first of all, by nature, I've, I've been an optimist. I'm a, an extremely cautious optimist uh, now. The accent is on the cautious after what happened to me, my family, and all of us to see my country disintegrate in front of my eyes. Uh, and that is that um, we are in Europe. We are on a continent that's called Europe. Because, you know, I've often woken up in these 30 years and said, my goodness, what if we were, you know, for all the things that we know in, in Africa or, or somewhere else. There is something called the European Union. 
and for all of its faults and all of its difficulties, it is still a beacon where democracy and the rule of law reign supreme. With all of the, you know, very difficult things that are happening with the economic crisis, with the crisis of the Eurozone, with the Greek debt crisis, you know, with the rise of the various populist right-wing movements, it still is the only game in town for us. It's a weakened game. Uh, it is one where people are cautious about saying what they belong. We have uh, lower levels of people answering the question, do you want to join the European Union, than we had 20 years ago, but in my country still somewhere around the 50% mark. I would call that a healthy support. It's not the kind of North Korean 99% support, but it's one where people understand. Why do I say that? Because there are so many people from the former Yugoslav republics who live in Austria, in France, in Germany, in Sweden, in Switzerland, in Italy, and these are people who left, They're the parents of the people who, who live today left in the 60s as far as Yugoslavia is concerned. Tito opened the borders, there was unemployment. But why do I stress this? Because Yugoslavs knew what is happening in Europe since the 60s. People travel, you know, from Vienna to Belgrade, it's a six hour car drive or a 40 minute flight. Uh, I talked to Uber drivers who are from my country. I said, when were you there the last time? Oh, last weekend I went to visit my family in, in Leskovac or, or Nish or elsewhere. And again, why do I say that? Because when people, if people were to vote today or next Sunday, do you want to join the European Union? We would have a great majority who would join. Why? Very simply because the greatest number of people have simple common sense. They know that there is a greater level of certainty, a greater level of predictability, and a somewhat greater level of prosperity than if you stay outside of the European Union. Now, of course, that might change, just like my country disappeared, the European Union can disappear, but that is why we have to be very watchful about what is happening and why a country like Yugoslavia that's completely different than the European Union, which has basic institutional democratic structures, we must be watchful so that we don't go blindless into a return to the dark times in Europe, which is possible. Uh, okay, on that note, um, I wanted to open it up. Uh, if there are any questions from the audience? Yeah. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Nick Van Prague. That's a fascinating conversation. Uh, I have a couple of questions. One is on the role of the Hague Tribunal in, in, in facilitating, perhaps, or not, uh, the, the process of, of, of people coming together. Uh, and the, the, you mentioned the sort of European vocation of Serbia. Um, I just read the biography, George Packer's biography of Dick Holbrook and his role in, in, in Yugoslavia. And I was wondering how you saw the American role. And third question, as a Brit, uh, what message would you have to Brexiting Britain uh, from Yugoslavia? And uh, what might make them sit up, sit up and think again about that particular experience? Well, the last question is the easiest, don't do it. <laughs> it's, uh, and and I, I've quoted already several times, not, not here but elsewhere, when um, the North Macedonian Foreign Minister Nikola Dimitrov, who's a close friend, and you know, they'll join NATO now soon and obviously they want, hopefully they get a date to begin negotiations with the European Union in, in, in the Netherlands, he was asked by some journalists, he said, well, you know, why do you want to join? Look at Europe, it, it's in a destitute state, it's sort of falling apart at the edges. And his simple answer was, you don't know what it is like to be outside of the European Union. And so, yeah, we're following Brexit and, uh, you know, we're keeping our fingers crossed. Um, on the Hague Tribunal, excellent question, uh, the, the way that people like myself like to say it, because Belgrade, Zagreb, and Sarajevo are unhappy with the Hague Tribunal, that means there must be something right about the Hague Tribunal. Again, there's nothing angelic about it, but it was crucially important that it existed and that it did what it did. 
I can share with you that just after the fall of Milosevic, I was then working for the Open Society Foundation in, in Belgrade that then still covered Montenegro and, and Kosovo. We talked to judges, constitutional court judges, that were expelled by Milosevic and that were reinstated by the new democratic regime to run the court. And we, as, as citizens, said, you know, well, finally we will be able to try Milosevic in front of our courts. And they said, we can't do it. It's too complicated. It's too... And so the reason that there is a Hague Tribunal because the, the courts were unable to, to handle such big trials. And yes, you know, if, if we were legal experts on, on, on all these things, we'd find many faults. And even as citizens, we've found many faults because there are people who have been freed from the tribunal for whom we know have committed crimes. Uh, whereas others uh, are rightfully, uh, you know, uh, sitting in jail today for, for everything that they did. So, on balance, I would say it, it was and still is uh, a, a very important uh, institution. I forget the second question that the you The second had. one was about America. Dick yeah, Holbrook America, and the American role. Extremely, Rome. extremely important role. Continues to be extremely important. The U.S. rightfully handed over the dealing with, with former Yugoslav states and, and the Balkans to the European Union because we are part of European geography, what I call the, the last unintegrated part of core geographic Europe or the inner courtyard uh, of Europe. But as we see even today, uh, you know, the US has appointed a special envoy, Matthew Palmer, a very uh, knowledgeable uh, diplomat who served in, at the US Embassy in Belgrade, etc. Holbrook uh, played an extremely important role um, in, in kind of uh, conducting Holbrookian uh, hard-nosed diplomacy, uh, who managed to bring all these leaders to, to Dayton, Ohio, you know, the, one of the biggest air bases in the world. I remember a headline in, in the New York Times when they all went to Dayton uh, that said that the payroll, the budget of salaries in, of the 20,000 employees at Dayton was bigger than the budget of Bosnia and Herzegovina. So just to give you a scale of, of, of U.S. kind of politics. And, uh, you know, it was a time when certain things came together where it was possible to bring peace uh, finally to Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, of course, the Constitution was written by American legal State Department experts, just like they wrote the Constitution of Japan after World War II. This is what happens when you allow yourself to be exposed to, to foreign influence and not able to solve your problems yourself. Uh, as we see, Bosnia and Herzegovina remains the most complicated of the former Yugoslav states, far from any solution. Uh, people attributed to, to the Dayton Agreement. Yeah, partially it is, but it's also partially to the fact that we still have nationalist leaders in Bosnia who very merrily live with each other and uh, I would say help each other to be re-elected at every election. And until society musters uh, sort of energy in a situation of demographic decline and uh, again, as Ivan Krasta was saying, uh, an illness that we're all suffering for of these younger generations leaving our countries, we won't see uh, a movement forward. But the key thing, again, I return to that, is the existence of the European Union and that we are in the midst of it that has, I would very simply say, a tempering effect. And secondly, uh, I think it's important also to notice that there's a, there, there are a lot of doomsayers that are saying there will be war again. No, there will not be war again on these lands because we did that very recently and we have harsh memories of it. And whatever politicians say to you know, up their support, they don't want to go there either. But they're playing with fire with that kind of rhetoric. More questions? Many thanks, Ivan. This is so interesting. When I look back at the 90s, um, I remember explanatory narratives 
that were doing exactly what you highlighted, like saying this is the exception within the European pattern. And they were pointing at the multi-religious and multi-ethnic composition and decomposition. So I was wondering what you would say about that today as factors for both things, composition and decomposition of former Yugoslavia. Wow, that's a big question, Milos. <laughs> um, yeah, we, you know, I, I, I grew up part of my childhood in Belgrade, and uh, Belgrade being the capital, the, the biggest city uh, of, of the Balkans at that time, you know, close to two million people. In the classroom, we didn't know who was Serb, who was Croat, who was Roma. Well, we knew sort of who the Roma were, the Roma kids. Um, uh, you know, who was Jewish, who was... We were simply all equal, there was no distinction. Those who came from Bosnia were all Bosnians, no matter whether they were Serb, Croat, or Bosniak, or Muslim, whatever you, you call them. It was indistinguishable. So there was, you know, to simplify, a sort of melting pot that was happening. I learned from friends who had li uh, grown up in Bosnia in smaller towns that these differences were slowly also being lost between uh, the, the different nationalities. And, you know, to, to do a counterfactual or, or a sort of uh, paradoxical statement, uh, the fact uh, sort of communism disappeared maybe 10 years too early for Yugoslavia. Had we gone over that hump where the generational and ethnic and religious divides would have been completely lost, we maybe would not have had to go uh, into a war, but we did because the memories were still there in, in the smaller towns and then the grievances were still there. Um, largely a secular society, even though it was Christian, Orthodox, Catholic and, and, and Muslim populations. I mean, Bosnia in terms of, of Islam, you know, largely, largely secular. Of course, there was a return to religion a sort of recomposition of religion after the fall of communism. People started going back to church, you know, marrying in church, uh, practicing, but not in any intense way, more in the cultural sense, you know, belonging to, uh, to, belong to your ethnic group meant belonging to a, to a certain religion. And of course, it had strong aspects during the war. But let me just say, of course, that the war was extremely complex in the fact that there was a lot of cooperation between the warring sides. You know, literally, uh, Croatians were leasing out artillery to the Serbs and vice versa when they were, you know, discussing uh, with each other. Uh, with my wife, we traveled through Bosnia this summer and uh, in a museum, the first thing the Bosnian uh, um, uh, keep, uh, curator said, immediately said, you know, well, this was a war of pillage. And of course, those of us who lived it, we were hearing these stories. There was pillage. People went in to, you know, kick out the families and steal the television, the refrigerator, the car, etc. So it was a very dirty war, apart from being a a, a terrible, violent, traumatic war where a lot of people were, were killed. And the other little story that's very important, a lot of the, the stories from the towns where these communities lived very well, and some cities like Tuzla survived where the community stays, but a lot of the stories said they came from the outside and brought us the war. It wasn't started in the town, it was brought by the extreme elements. And an additional thing I'd like to share, and I, I shared the article with, with John, is that what was very indicative that this society was not ready for war was that there was huge draft, the resistance to be drafted to go to war. In Belgrade, 90% of the people who were called up to serve in the military refused to go and fight. And that is why in the Serbian case, Milosevic, had to let criminals from jail to create paramilitaries that would go and do the dirty war fighting. And even more, I would say, exceptional was in the small towns of Serbia, you had a draft resistance 
anywhere between 40 and 50 percent of people. And you can imagine in a small town, everybody knows each other to say, no, I'm not going to fight for Milosevic in this war because it's not my war. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, uh, although unfortunately I missed a part of uh, your presentation. Um, I and mean, therefore, I'm not fully aware, did you raise the Kosovo issue? Because we have to see that the relationship between Serbs and Albanians and the Kosovo conflict stood at the very beginning of, the, um, of, of Yugoslavia's falling apart. In, I lived in Yugoslavia from 85 to 89, and uh, um, there was already uh, this absolutely anti-Albanian mood also in Belgrade. I was shocked. I met friends whom I knew from my studies in the 70s in Belgrade, and they were very anti-Albanian. Uh, that was, of course, steered by propaganda a lot, uh, but you had the meetings uh, which actually started in Kosovo and then were held in other places throughout Serbia and in Bosnia. And at that time, the majority, or in, at least in Slovenia and in um, Croatia, were almost like paralyzed and didn't know what was going on. This, I speak about the eight years, 88, 89. And I think the Kosovo case is still not finished. So how do you see uh, how this may be solved? Thank you very much for, for asking that question. It is indeed uh, one of the very important uh, parts of the, of the dynamic of, of what happened in Yugoslavia. And in fact, for those of you who know and have followed Yugoslavia, in fact, the first big demonstrations of uh, Kosovo Albanians were in 1968, uh, when they wanted, because Kosovo was uh, an autonomous province of Serbia, and Serbia was the only republic that had two autonomous provinces, Vojvodina in the north and uh, Kosovo in the south. And the Kosovo uh, Albanians, the nationalists, uh, had started demanding that Kosovo achieve a status of a republic, of a seventh republic, which was of course denied during uh, communist times. Then there were demonstrations in 1981 uh, that were repressed and then Milosevic, uh, in 1989-1990 uh, went and uh, revoked the autonomy of Kosovo because Kosovo, a bit like Scotland and Wales, had its parliament, had decision-making powers uh, in, on its territory, on things like agriculture, education. And the 1974 constitution, which is a key part of the history of the breakdown, is that the two autonomous provinces got a lot of say. And then there was something called the uh, sort of progressive albanization of Kosovo politics where the Serbs were somewhat sidelined. So there's a lot of sort of history there. And that of course then exacerbated once the autonomy was taken away, the Albanian population of Kosovo decided to have a referendum and to, which was of course unrecognized, to have independence. And then finally the, you know, we came to the bombing of, of Yugoslavia by NATO. Uh, 20 years ago, which, which basically led to the end of, of the Milosevic regime and then the declaration of independence in 2008 by, by Kosovo. Uh, you're right to say this is unsolved. There's a new effort and drive to uh, go and, and find a solution. Uh, the European Union has said to Serbia, uh, once it began the process of accession, very clearly, uh, we will not take in a new member state like Cyprus that has an unresolved territorial issue. This message, and even when I was with Prime Minister Gingic, has been drummed down our, our throats uh, very clearly, and all Serbian leaderships have known that this must be solved one way uh, or the other. The negotiation started in 2011 under President Tadic, the, the previous government, uh, it was Catherine Ashton, the previous uh, high representative, that achieved an agreement in April 2013 uh, and uh, a process that led to uh, sort of a piecemeal resolving of everything from telephone number to uh, 
university diplomas to the water sharing to you know license plates on cars and it has been very slow the arrival of president vucic and thaci uh, led to the fact that they decided let's try and speed this up and find a solution uh, they made quite a lot of headway uh, mediated by federica mogherini the high rep uh, but then there was opposition to the type of deal they wanted to go forward, and this was a stalled in a kind of, kind of tit-for-tat because Kosovo imposed 100% tariffs on Serbian and Bosnian and Herzegovinian goods, and Serbia said we're not going back to the table until they are revoked. Serbia, on the other hand, began a process of convincing countries that had recognized Kosovo independence to um, to, to de-recognize, uh, about 12 countries have, have done so, mostly small Pacific island states uh, in the middle of nowhere have done that, um, but clearly everyone understands. And the fact that the U.S. has appointed Matt Palmer as special envoy, there's an announcement that the new commission will appoint a EU special envoy, you know, bodes well. We're not holding our breath. I mean, there's an ideal scenario that they could achieve a, uh, an agreement by if, you know, if everything falls into place, a lot will depend on the elections, parliamentary elections in Kosovo that are being held uh, now in, in a week's or two weeks' time, I can't remember the exact date, and depending on the government and the willingness uh, to go forward. On the Serbian side, I think whatever you may think of President Vucic, he is determined to solve this. Whether there's a partner on the other side, whether there's enough convincing from the U.S. and Europe to move forward, uh, we'll see. Is that time, or we have time for more? Or? One more question? <laughs> yeah, sure. I would just like to go to, back to one thing you spoke about the past. If you, this very moment, were offered a position to advise the governments in former Yugoslavia how to deal with the, the recent past, what would you tell them to do? You mean under the communist government? No, I mean uh, how to, uh, uh, whether one should hush uh, what happened during the recent wars, what, how should one deal with World War II, as you well know, it was all hushed and it all came up and everyone used it politically. And just to go back to your Spanish example, you're absolutely right, but you do know that it is only one side that uh, now wants the crimes to be exposed and that is the Republican side. So uh, Spain has demonstrated that 70 years after the end of the war, everyone knows on, who, on which side were their grandparents. And your update as to Dayton, last year there was a documentary by Frontline that is the public broadcaster of the US about Dayton as an example of a city that fell apart. So I don't know, it, it was right after the big conference. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Miriam, for your question. No, I, I, you know, I've, I've thought a lot about this simply as a, as, as a citizen and as a person living uh, a country that, that had this history, I am convinced that one must address the past uh, uh, in, in any shape or form. And, and my kind of boilerplate answer to people was, look, there's, uh, in, in the case of what happened to us, there's the dealing with the past at the international level, the Hague Tribunal. Uh, and then there's the next level, which is the domestic level, where governments have to do much apologizing you know, President Tadic went to Srebrenica twice. Uh, President Djukanovic has apologized many times to the Croatians. And, and as we see in Germany, and you know, Steinmeier went to, to Warsaw recently and he apologized once again. So 70 years after, uh, or, or I don't know how many. So there, there needs to be a constant message from the top of politics uh, that, you know, we realize what happened and we're again sorry for what happened. And then, there's the final and equally important level of the kind of reckoning of society itself with what happened. And that is where education, school books, going to visit, you know, the concentration camps, having children learn, taking victims to classrooms like has happened with Holocaust victims going to school. And again, it's, it's a constant work. Uh, 
Now, what I have said, you know, when people came and foreign journalists came to Belgrade after the war in the years, and the immediate question is, what are you doing about wrecking the past? I said, look, in a society that has gone through this, that people live impoverished, are looking for jobs, you don't wake up in the morning as a citizen and say, what am I doing about wrecking the past? Your first preoccupation is, how do I find a job and how do I put food on the table? So, I like to take the example of Berlin. You know, the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin was only made how many decades after World War II. So, these things take time. It doesn't uh, mean that one wants to justify the length, but it's simply there's a way of doing these things. You know, you walk about a, a city like Vienna and you know, you find these places where the Gestapo was, you know, where, uh, you know, I read the story about Asperger syndrome and people have said, well, you shouldn't call it that because that was a Nazi doctor in Vienna who was actually experimenting on children, so let's find another name for this. And there's a memorial to the children that he killed during his experience during the war in the city. So what I'm saying is it's a very complex way, but I would say education and telling the story in Serbian schools of what Milosevic's regime did and whom he killed. He killed his best man and best friend, Ivan Stambolic. He killed the journalist Churuvia during the bombing because he was afraid that Churuvia would kind of indict him with, with his witness. So, uh, not nothing easy about that. You know, how long does it take the, the US to talk about what they did to the American Indians? Um, uh, so, one has to be humble about this, but again, must be determined to address this. Um, and I would just like to say one thing. We grew up in Yugoslavia, and for the sake of, you know, kind of everybody being close to each other, in elementary school, we really didn't learn that Serbia paid the highest price of any nation during World War I. It has the greatest number of victims of any country. I, the, the male population was decimated. Serbia lost half of its male population in World War I because, of course, those were still the heroic days when everybody, intellectuals and rich people, went to war. And, you know, this is part of, this is an element that fuels later on, oh, they didn't tell us, so we were, you know, the bad, the, we were the worst side. So I think there's a, his teaching history is difficult, but there must be a way in which these things can be told without kind of provoking the other side. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ivan. Um, I know I learned a lot during this and reading your work. I hope everyone else uh, learned almost as much. Um, and uh, that's it. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, John.